Hi, Dark Sick Nurse Podcast, guys. Welcome to the podcast today. I have Fatima. She is here talking about nursing informatics. So she is my first informatics nurse. I cannot wait to dive into what you're doing with your career. Thank you, Sandra. I'm really happy to be here. I'm excited to meet you and excited to share my knowledge about nursing informatics with you and with all your listeners. Let's dive right in. Describe what your current job title is, what you do for a living, how you see your role and what it is that you do. Um, So my current job title is Programs and Solutions Manager. So what it is in a more generic terms, it's a clinical informatics manager. And what I do on a regular basis involves a lot of problem solving, a lot of analysis, collaboration in consensus building with different stakeholders so that we can come towards an understanding and an agreement of what informatic solutions to provide to our patients and our clinicians so that it helps them make decisions in a better way or better, more informed decisions. And that helps to improve the outcomes of both our patients as well as our other stakeholders, including clinicians and our leadership as well. When I think about informatics, and I know that you're totally going to like scold me for this, but basically my idea of informatics is EMR, a nurse that's really good at electronic medical records and really is looking for system processes to flow better, how to make Mm -hmm. the nursing world really flow with the technology world. That might be a really rudimentary understanding of what informatics is, but I guess that's kind of what one of the things maybe a listener is thinking like, okay, I've heard of informatics, but really what does that entail, that area of nursing? Yeah, and you are not mistaken at all, Sandra. So part of informatics is using systems, right? And using, including the EMR. But at its core, informatics really is, and especially nursing informatics, is about your knowledge and expertise in nursing. And then you marry that, you combine that with your knowledge and skills in other analytical science. So technology being one of them, computer science being one of them, but also mathematics, like statistics. So that's one of the very basic things about nursing informatics is You need to have some knowledge, skill, and expertise in nursing, and then you combine that with other analytical and informational sciences. And what you do with that is you use those skills and your knowledge and your expertise, and you use them to form data and information into knowledge and wisdom. And why do we want to do that? We want to do that so that we can look at problems, we can look at issues and find a way to solve those problems and issues using informatic solutions. So informatic solutions can be EMR implementation, that's one of them, but it can be a report that brings to light certain patterns and trends so that those patterns and trends can be identified and a problem can be looked at more deeply and therefore solved. So there's a lot of different things that you can actually do in nursing informatics. We use our logic, we use our creativity and our knowledge of nursing, as well as other analytical sciences, so that we can help our patients as well as clinicians. So nurses, doctors, allied health, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, lab lab staff, we help all of them, even help operational areas and help them make better decisions and help come about better outcomes. I'm getting this word picture as you're talking and describing what you're doing as like the, you know, the nervous system in the body, how it allows for everything to communicate. I kind of feel like informatics is that those nerves going out from right, the peripheral, like sending out signals to the core of like, hey, listen, We want to document a bed wound the moment somebody rolls into the emergency room because we want to know, did the patient come in with the bed wound or do we want to, with this way, do we want to know if it was acquired when he was here in the hospital? So that needs to be documented. Mm -hmm. And then that ends up leading into clinical practice. So the nurse does a skin assessment. The moment the patient hits the door, it goes into the EMR. And then we're able to show, hey, where, when did that bed wound occur? And so you're now able to direct patient care by having 
kind of marrying those two things, the nursing work with the EMR or whatever mm -hmm. technology statistics, because we know patients that come in with the bed wound, they're going to be more likely to have that. Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. So you can actually begin to, again, communicate back to the body in that same analogy that I was describing. And that is the Johnson medical. I love that. <laughs> I love I, that. But you were doing such a great job describing it. It was just the work picture that I saw. It. <laughs> yeah. Like, so yeah, they're kind of like the nerves that communicate with like, how is this working? What's the pulse on this? Like, is it, is it yeah. doing what it's supposed to? So that's yeah. another really metaphor great. that we, we use is actually the, a bridge or a translator between different worlds. Cause here's the clinical world and we use like different concepts, different mindsets. We use certain types of terminology and here's the other new clinical world, right? We, we talk with not just not just developers of technology, but also program managers or project managers. We talk to analysts. And so an informatics nurse stands in that crossroads and says, okay, let me help all of you understand each other. And, oh, and that's that. our role. Yeah, I love that. You're a translator for anyone. To, and again, it's such an incredible thing because one of the things that I love about nursing and one of the things that I have found as I've been diving into these conversations with, with nurses that are doing incredible things with their careers is talking about how they've married nursing with something mm -hmm. else. And they're able to find that zone in between that they can operate right. in where it's like, I've married nursing with technology. I've married nursing with, you know, you know, real estate. I've married nurse. Like they all find little yes. different weird things. And it's like, how did you get here? How did you decide, you know, that these nursing skills can translate into something <clears throat> else? And I think that that is just such an incredible thing that you were, you were educating other people on. So you didn't just wake up and become a nurse in, a nurse and a nurse in informatics. Like you didn't just know well, this knowledge didn't descend from above. You've worked right to get to this point right. in career. Right. So tell me a little bit about that journey to this spot. So it was a long and circuitous journey. It started when I came to the U.S. I came to the U.S. when I was 30 years old as an immigrant from the Philippines. And I started in a med surge unit. I started working in a med surge unit in Florida. Um, while waiting for my meds, my RN license, I worked for a few months as a CNA. And then I started working as a med surge nurse. But in that community hospital in Florida, they actually already had an EMR at that in the early 2000s. I'm going to age myself. I'm going to In the early 2000s, <laughs> they had an amazing, me at that time, coming from the Philippines, where charting was on exclusively on paper. They had an EMR, and it even allowed us to scan the barcodes of our medications. Um, so to me, that was like, oh my God, I really have come to a first world country. It was hard work, but one of the things that was pretty good at right away was the charting part because I felt like I had an aptitude for just understanding where things needed to go, what needed to be done on, in the documentation. And I didn't even need a lot of help doing it, right? Like I, I was precepted. But in that sense, I didn't even need the much precepting. And one of the questions that I asked my friends and my coworkers at that time was, are nurses involved in building this kind of thing? Because to me, I think it just makes sense that nurses would be involved. But at that time, I think it was a little too early <laughs> to be asking that question. Um, they didn't know. They thought there might be, but they didn't know. So fast forward a couple of years and I moved to California with my husband and we moved to Silicon Valley and to a large academic medical center. There. And they were part of their institution was still on paper, but parts, certain parts were already using EMRs and they had a two step EMR implementation project where they initially implemented one type of EMR. And then about a couple of years later, they implemented another EMR, which was Epic. And it was, I was very fortunate in that institution because they valued education and they were very supportive of my career growth. And I volunteered, I was new to the institution, but I volunteered 
to be a super user for that first. I was you know, going to ask you if you were using. <laughs> yeah, I mean, have the, I, my institution as well. Super mm-hmm. user, epic people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. At that time, it was actually CareCast. So it's not a very well-known EMR anymore. So I became a CareCast super user. And for my listener, I just thought a super user, what does that mean? For someone that's like, I've never heard of that. Oh, okay. So a super user is one of the roles that you can actually do while you're still at the bedside or in a clinical job that's kind of an informatics role already because you are trained on how to use the EMR system a little bit more than your colleagues. And then when the implementation day comes around, or the implementation period comes around because sometimes it takes more than just a day or two. It takes a week or more sometimes. You become the user at the bedside that helps your coworkers. Yeah. So you go troubleshoot, you run when they're having trouble documenting. And so I have a lot of funny stories about that, but we'll, I'll tell you more about it later. So I started as a super user for CareCast. Um, when I was new to that institution, I was a step-down ICU nurse. About a year later, I was invited to apply to the neurosurge trauma ICU, which I did. And then shortly after I got off the three-month training program in the ICU, they were again looking for super users, this time for Epic. And this is just a testament to how people have supported me along the way. Because I mm-hmm. asked my mentor at that time, I said, I'm really interested. I, you know, I was really happy to be a CareCast super user, but I'm a little hesitant to, because I'm new to this unit. And she said, no apply because I've seen you as a, as a super user for CareCast. I know what you can do. And then I'll put in a good word for you. So I was actually one of the newest members in that department, but who became a super user also. So that was a really, really valuable experience for me. Mm-hmm. And that was actually the experience that helped me to decide that I can be a good informatics nurse, that this was going to be a career that I was not just going to do it to have work, but I was going to do it because I was good at it. I was going to be thriving. I was going to be growing. And so I started doing the steps to get there. Yeah, And that's when I hit some hurdles because I didn't know the first thing to do, right? Like, Okay, I was going to come up with a resume and try to apply at my own institution. Unfortunately, I was a little late to the game because by the time I decided to apply, all the roles were already filled. And so I said, okay, now I don't know what to do. Like, do you know that feeling that you're so excited to start? Yes. But you don't know. You finally found, you finally found <laughs> what you think that you're being called to do, right? That, yes. that passion. It's like, this is where I think I would just flourish. This would be, this wouldn't feel like work. This would feel like mm-hmm. I was moving in a strength and in something that I'm passionate Correct. about, which is easy. And that's not work. That's just called yeah. finding in something that fun you enjoy. Easy. <laughs> it's much fun. Oh, fun. Yeah. Uh, so that's actually when I started looking back. That's when I started to create the system that I teach to other nurses now. But at that time, I was just really just trying to figure out how do I break into this nursing specialty I think is my calling. And fortunately, I was able to land a job in another academic medical center in the San Francisco Bay Area. There were some challenges there too because it was now like an hour away from where I lived at that time. It was called EHR Application Analyst, was my first job. I absolutely loved it. It was Epic Application Analyst. And I actually spent my first day in the Epic headquarters in Wisconsin, even before I'd I'd seen my desk at my hospital that I so wait, did that, that that feel like going to Mecca for you? Was that like your like a quintessential Mecca was being able to go to Epic headquarters? Is that what you're? Yeah, <laughs> it's like, not really, no, because I didn't, I didn't know. I had no idea that it would involve training in their headquarters. I thought okay. I was going to be trained in in the hospital. Yeah, and it was it was great because yeah. I was 
everything was so new. And I don't know if you've been to the headquarters. No. Is it amazing? You like heard, Google? Is it like a Google? It's like, like a, a, I think even better than the Google headquarters because I live near the Google headquarters. Uh-huh. It's this huge campus with huge buildings. And then the rooms that you study in or you get trained in are, they have themes. And for a geek like me, those themes were like just right up my alley. Star Trek, next generation. Star, yeah. So the Harry Potter. That is so cool. And, and this, this was, was like going to Mecca. This was like going to like some place you've always wanted to see, you know? Yeah. It's the Disneyland for it's Disneyland for informatics. Yes. Oh, that is so cool. Or healthcare technology. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. And then they, you know, they teach you, they feed you there, and it's set in like a pastoral setting. So it's a geek yeah. headquarters set in like very pastoral setting with cows in the distance. So. Oh, so, so peaceful. Yeah. You didn't want to leave. I think, I think you really yeah. want that. So they, so they trained you there. So that you they trained me there to prepare for my first job in nursing informatics. And so I did that for a couple of years, helped that institution implement Epic. After that, I went to consulting. And the reason that I went to consulting, consulting was never in my plan. But at that time, a lot of my friends and coworkers went into consulting and they, they were telling me, you know, you can work for three months and take one month off, then work for another three to six months and take another month off. And I had a little baby at that time. And I'm like, oh. sign me up to do that. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty lucrative. Is that why you can kind of work and then take a break and work and take a break? Yes. At that yeah. time, it was very lucrative. I think also yeah. because just of the demand at that time. At that time, it was around 2012, 2013. I... Don't know if you remember the Affordable Care Act. Part of the Affordable yes. Care Act is the High Tech Act, which mandated primary care. US yes. To yeah. yes to implement an EMR, a certified EMR by 2015. And so, if they met that deadline, they would get incentives. But if they don't meet the deadline, the penalties would start after that. So. In 2012 and 2013, there was a lot of demand for consultants like I was. And that was why it was a little You were in mama uh, and you wanted to be home. So it gave you yes. flexibility. Yes. Yes. And I did have like a kind of a high standard because I was a new mama. My friends traveled to their client site every from Mondays to Thursdays and came home either Thursday night or Friday night or Friday morning. And I said, I don't want to do that because... That's a little too much. I said, I think the the minimum I would do is every other week. And so I had those other standards and it took me about 10 months to find the institution that, you know, kind of met my goals or aligned with my goals. And I loved it. And so instead of doing what my friends did, which was take like a contract for three to six months and then take a one month break. I ended up staying at that institution for a little over three years yeah. as a consultant, as a consultant. So by holding yeah. out for what you wanted, you were able to actually find something that was long term. And I think that's Correct. important for, our, for, my, for my listeners to hear. Like sometimes you think it's just the quick fix, like just take it, whatever, mm-hmm. be glad you work, but you're not prioritizing. And I talk about this all the time to prioritize your goals and the non-negotiables. These are things that you're just like, it's not happening. It's just can't, it can't be done because once you set your mind on that and you fixate on that goal, the mm-hmm. universe begins. And I, I hate to say the universe. Yes. Things no, begin I understand. To, <laughs> things begin to align. It, yeah. You're just like, and I found exactly what I was looking for and then ended up being yeah. here. You know, it's just like, I, mean, I would have never thought, you know? Right. And in the beginning, I thought, like, am I doing this wrong? Because I was on the phone, I, you know, almost every week talking to recruiters for several months, like almost 10 months. And some something just wasn't clicking right. And I'm like, and then my friends were going off consulting and telling me about, you know, staying in hotels in their hotels and all their travel being paid for and so on and so forth. I'm like, but I don't want to go if it doesn't meet these like three things yeah. that was in my mind. Yeah. And you're looking at your and, like, I don't want to leave. 
Right. I don't want to leave my, yeah, that was, that was one of it. Like, I don't want to leave my baby every week, like every Monday to Thursday. And so, yes, it does click when you hold out for your, you know, for your goals. And, but sometimes it takes a while to click. Yeah. Stay true. So that was, Stay true. Yes. Yeah. And then after that, my family's needs changed. My own needs changed. And I wanted to be local. Because my daughter was growing up and she had school. I wanted to be part of whatever things were happening in her school, right? Not even doing a few times that I traveled for, for that consulting job. And so I took a local job and I actually thought I was just going to be there for a short while, but I'm here. I think I've been here for six years now. Oh, wow. Because I love it. I love. Do you love mm -hmm. it? Yes. What do you love about your job? I love that I have the opportunity to make a positive change, not just on systems, but on patients, right? Through, by making positive change in the workflows for clinicians and how we're, we're approaching the issues and problems that clinicians have so that they can, as I mentioned, make decisions better or have the, the information at their fingertips or just make some tweaks in their workflow that's going to make it better. And the other thing is that I am now a man manager and I've had the opportunity to hire and coach informatics nurses in my team. And so seeing them, you know, grow in coaching and mentoring them and like transferring my knowledge and skills to them is something that I felt so fulfilling that no, I'm, I'm saying. So. Like, I love it. Yeah. No, because yeah. it's true. When you get to a certain point in your career where you understand really what you're doing and you're an expert mm -hmm. in your field, then it really does become incumbent upon you to now ex take that expertise and give it to people and say, hey, listen, I understand this really well and I want to be successful. So I want to build up others because now this is your legacy, right? Fatima, like, Correct. what you're That's describing correct. is I'm creating my legacy and you're mm -hmm. doing that not only through your work, but you're also doing that through your coaching business, which I would love to Correct. hear a little bit about. So you, yeah. have your own, you have your own little side hustle, which you know, if you're the Dr. Nurse podcast, yeah. I'm all about that. All about making that little side. Uh, so yeah, tell totally yeah. me about that. So my side hustle actually started as something that was just for my own convenience, which was when I started my very first nursing informatics job, my friends started asking me about it, right? Like, I, I was in a high, in a very high acuity ICU situation and suddenly I switched. I gave my two weeks notice and they were like, where are you going? I said, I was, I'm going to be an informatics nurse. And so people were like, what's that? So I started sharing with my friends and then they started sharing with other people in our unit. And so between the time that I gave my two weeks notice and the time that I left, other nurses in my unit, some of them I didn't really know very well, I dropped into my room, dropped by my room and started asking me questions and I answered them. But then I was started getting text messages from people I hardly knew from my own hospital yeah. and was answering, you know, similar questions. So I said, okay, I'm going to make a Facebook page so that I can direct people to that Facebook page. That's a good thing. This was in 2010. And I started and Facebook pages are not the most easy things to upload, update, and so on. And so the, the year after that, I said, let me make a really basic web page about nursing informatics. And so I just came up with a web page and started like little blogs here and there. And, and whenever someone would ask me, I said, oh yeah, look at my blog. And for a while, I forgot all about my little blog because it was just there. And I would just answer like a few comments here and there. But later on, I was getting a lot of comments and, and messages from, it actually started with nursing students who were asking me to help with their homework because their homework had nursing informatics questions. And then it was master of students and then a few DNP students. So I'm like, oh, maybe I need to update this little blog. Yeah. And so I started updating it and other nurses found me who were not just interested in the academic part of it. But they started asking me about like, how do I improve my resume or like, how do I 
Like, what's the first thing I need to do? And so I started helping them in that way. Yeah, because there's no certification to be a nurse in informatics. You don't have to take a certification or have they developed um, that now? Is there that is a certification by ANCC, but it's not a requirement. It's a certification more kind of like an affirmation. That you know what you're doing. doing. That you know what you're doing, but it's not required by many. Some some job postings say preferred, but not really required. Okay, got it. And so for a while, I was just doing that, like helping people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then it came to the point where I was kind of juggling too many questions from many different people. And a really interesting thing happened. In 2019, I said, okay, let me like create a group training thing and I'll take about three months to prepare for it. I'm going to distill all my knowledge from over a decade, for almost a decade at that time of knowledge and, you know, work out the system that I used to land, not just my first job, but my, you know, my, my first three jobs as an informatics nurse. And I decided that I would start doing that in February, 2020. Very interesting because COVID. you know what happened in January. Every, yes. Everyone now. Everyone went remote oh, yeah. and wanting to work from home. Yeah. And so I, that's what I started doing. And over time, I've made some improvements in, you know, in the training program. I've seen results in other nurses. And I've seen like one of the very first things that I was able to help them with was gain clarity about what it is that they actually want from nursing informatics. Because nursing informatics or being an informatics nurse is not a, it's not a one type of role. There's actually different roles in nursing informatics. You can be a coordinator, you can be an analyst, you can be a developer, an educator, or a combination of these things, a project manager, a consultant, right? And so one of the first things that I teach is these are the different roles. What would you like to do? And it is kind of like a, a clouds party moment for many of them because they think, oh, an informatics nurse is someone who does things with the EMR, kind of like you, you gave an example earlier. And, <laughs> and so when they, when they realize that there's so much more to do and to grow into, they're like, oh, wow, this is really what I want to do. And so I've been doing that since early 2020 and really also enjoy, you know, mentoring and coaching and training other nurses to get started in this like growing specialty. It's a new, growing, thriving specialty. And so I'm really excited about that. Oh, I think that was just absolutely like quintessential like I feel like it was a poster child for the doctor nurse podcast like you'd be it because it is just again teaching a nurse totally just immersing herself in something getting really mm -hmm. good at it one prioritizing her needs in nursing to make sure that right. she's a present mama she's doing the things that she can't look back at the end of her life and think mm -hmm. I chose this consulting job and I, I burned myself out and missed this time with my child. Like you were just like, no, like I just, I waited. I, I waited for that fish to come along to catch. That was the one that I right. wanted. And then you were able to still continue progressing your career while you were able to prioritize the thing that was the most important to you. And yes. And then at the end, now that you've got all this depth of knowledge, you're able to create something that you can then have complete autonomy over and have this side generating Definitely. income that eventually you never know what this will lead to, especially as you continue to show yourself as an expert and that you truly understand how to get people from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah. This is a service that you're creating. And now you've mm -hmm. gotten something that you've got complete autonomy over. That is just, again, I think like, as I look at my career, the thing that I want for my career is just, I don't necessarily always want, I, I didn't. I didn't realize that, but I, I've learned that this is not the thing that I've always wanted. It was just to be held into the hospital work or, you know, whichever, but to be able to go and say, hey, listen, listen, I've got this thing that I can share with the world. That's mine. And I think mm -hmm. that's just absolutely the coolest thing. And really just, like I said, 
total picture perfect of, of what I think more nurses need to celebrate and talk about. So thank you for sharing all that. I love your journey. You're very welcome. Incredible. Yes. Your insight in, into yourself and what you really wanted for, for, for your life. And I, I just think it's really great. So I want to talk a little bit about one of the things I was thinking is like, you also just finished your MBA and how you decided or why you decided to choose the MBA over the master's degree in nursing, the MSN. We were talking mm -hmm. before the podcast and I was like, yeah. I think we need to bring this up and talk about it because a nurse that might be like, okay, well, I'll just get a master's degree in nursing and then become a nurse, you know, in, in informatics or, you know, why did she get the MBA? And I kind of wanted you to delineate as to why you chose that over the master's in nursing. Yes. Before I do that, I just wanted to, I want to say that I support lifelong learner, lifelong learning by nurses, right? Whatever format it takes, whether it's a formal degree, like an MSN or an MBA, or if nurses, pre other nurses prefer to do more like courses or boot camps, because I'm one of them. I'm one of you who are out there trying to learn as much as I can. Not so much to earn more, but really to just be the best that I can be. Whether it's being a, you know, being a, a good mom or a good manager or a good informatics nurse. Like, I just want to be that person who aims for excellence, not perfection, just excellence. I love every, like, please tell me more. Like what other like life, like le lessons have you learned? Tell me all of them because you're so wise. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and I know it, wisdom comes from challenges, right? From lessons yeah. learned, mistakes made. But going back to the MSN versus MBA decision that I made, it was not an easy decision. It actually took me years to decide, should I do an MSN? Should I do an MBA? While I was Thinking about that at the back of my mind, my career progressed as careers do. And I found myself in a position where my scope was no longer just about nursing informatics. I was, you know, responsible for programs that involved provider workflows and programs that involved like enterprise wide issues and solutions. And and so when I thought about that, I said to myself that an MBA seemed to be a more appropriate formal education for me. But even the, the decision to go with an MBA took a while and the decision about which school to go to, to go with took a while because an MBA is not an easy graduate degree to, to obtain to, or to apply to. And here again is, you know, my standards and my goals, because I was telling my hubby when I was I finally made the decision, I said, I want a fully online MBA and I don't want to pay for it. I want to be. You put that out I there. To, put it yeah, out I'm there. Put it out there. I don't want to pay for it. I want it. I want to be in an MBA program that would give me a hundred percent scholarship. And so. Very interestingly, I found an MBA program that was 100% online, and this was around July of 2020. And they were enrolling students, and because I think partly because of the pandemic, they weren't requiring a GMAT, and, and they were offering scholarships to some students, so merit-based scholarships. And so I applied, I got in, I got a 30% scholarship, and I'm like, should I? Yeah. This is not the 100% that I should put in. And so I emailed the admission master and I said, I think that I should get 100% sculpture. <laughs> nicely, very nicely for these reasons. And they were very nice. They responded right away and said, you know, we have a panel that makes the decisions. We really can't, but have you tried contacting your employer because they might have some program. Okay. And I said, okay, let me look into my benefits because I didn't really look into that. And it looked like my employer would reimburse certain educational activities. And so I emailed HR and they said they would reimburse this MBA. They're like, I'm just going to wait for you to show up because it's coming. I put it yes, out there. It's coming. And so it wasn't, it wasn't easy, right? Because because of the pandemic, there were increased Workloads, increased challenges for everyone. I, I'm sure nothing 
comparable to what our nurses at the front lines experienced. I, you know, nothing close. But there were other challenges to getting my team to to be remote or partly remote. That was one of the things that was a challenge because it's easy to think, yeah, I want to be remote, but but there's actually a lot of things that need to go into be remote, like, do you have the right equipment? Do you have the right chair so that you don't get a backache? So, so I am just very glad also that my supervisors and my organization was very supportive of, you know, making things happen correctly for, for that. But those were some of the challenges that I was having while I had committed to doing the MBA. <laughs> You're a beast. Um, You're an absolute beast. Fast forward 14 months and after literally not so much blood, but a lot of sweat and some tears, I obtained my MBA. Wow. Uh, I'm happy because there's a lot of very helpful information. And one of the things that I really loved about it was the I didn't know that improvements in operations can be measured that closely. So one of the things that I learned is, you know how in grocery stores that you you feel that you're in the slowest line. And when you transfer to another line, that becomes the slowest line. Why does it always happen to me? And, but there are some retail stores that just have the one line, right? And then as soon as another cashier opens and you go to that cashier. And that is actually came about by MBA type folks studying that workflow and putting formula, applying formula as to how, you know, that flow can be improved. So that was one of my eureka moments. Like, oh my God, I can measure these certain, you know, steps in the workflow and improve them using yeah. anal analytical. It's really cool to see your yeah. passion. And I embrace my nerdness. I love it. I, you know, what is so funny. I love Star Trek. And it was one of the things that my husband, when we got married, he was like, so like, you watch like, like old Star Trek? And I'm like, yeah, like Deep Space Nine, like Voyager. Like, oh my God. Yeah. I love those shows. And he's like, it's so nerdy. And I'm like, well, don't tell, I, I guess don't tell me what I don't know. And now I'm here, I'm announcing on the podcast. I like <laughs> Star Trek Deep Space Nine with Captain Janeway and John, yeah. Voyager, Captain Janeway. So. Voyager, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that yeah. show. I mean, my, my ideal captain is Captain Picard. Oh. But I feel like Deep Space Nine speaks to me in a different level because I feel like they're my neighbors. Yeah, that's so well <laughs> done. <laughs> You're so right. Like Picard is like, he's the one that we all aspire to be. But yeah, I yes. loved Captain Janeway. I just felt like she was so relatable. And yeah, I'm a t I, yeah, total nerd here with you. To see you and your passion is so inspiring. And to hear how, again, you set in your mind this thing and then you just wait for it to be fulfilled. And that's something that I've been reading a lot of books on kind of the laws of attraction and kind of bringing these mm -hmm. things to you. You have to set it in your mind and you have to fixate on it. Right. And you can't break. You can't. And again, like that's when you started, you're like, well, should I? 30% is not a hundred. Should I? And then you're like, I'm going to email them. Tell them I want a hundred. And they, yeah, like, you're just like, no, I'm going to keep going back to that that goal in my mind. And I think, again, that's why I believe anyone could obtain anything if you just mm -hmm. set your mind on it and you just fixate, yes. you just pour and yourself. What were you going to One of the things that I teach during my training program is to advocate for yourself, right? Because you can't wait for other people to advocate you. Definitely, there may be times that someone else will, but you know yourself best. So advocate for yourself. You do it in a gorgeous, respectful, even humorous manner, but do it. Yes, I love that. So for the last question of the podcast, I think we've talked about challenges. We've talked about mentorship. So could you tell me a little bit of advice that you would have given to Fatima as she was this baby, new baby nurse? You would look back and say, I would have told her this piece of advice to hold on to and a piece of advice mm -hmm. to, to a brand new nurse starting off in her career you wish you would have known. So to self who was crying when I was a brand new med search nurse yes. because no ratios and not very good pay. It's med search. <laughs> and, yes. And very hard work. I was crying. 
literally to my grandma in the Philippines. My grandma raised me. And I was like, I wouldn't go yeah. <laughs> to her. I would say, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Right? Like, do your best and figure out what you really want to do and then go after it. And it's going to be okay. Like, just relax a little bit, kid. <laughs> yeah. I feel like so many guests have also said that. Mm -hmm. Just, it's going to be okay. Just hang in there. And again, I think you've learned over time just to not compromise on those things. I think that's been a, a persistent right. message in your story of just set your mind on the things that are important to you and just don't deviate. Don't settle. Don't, don't pick second best just because you think first isn't coming. Right. Because it's coming. Just got to give it, you got to give it a little bit of time. It might not be right at the time that you think it should be showing up, but it's coming. So just right. hang it there mm -hmm. and it'll work itself out. That's really great. So for the last part of our interview is the rapid fire questions. Fatima, are you ready for the rapid fire questions? Sure thing. Let's go. What is your favorite Star Wars character? Leia. Oh, <laughs> Leia. Okay. It's Leia. And to you, what is the best age to be? My age. The age you are, right? Whatever age I am is the best age to be. I totally agree. <laughs> and for the last, the last interview question, I'm going to go off the script here. If you could be any Star Trek character, what would you want to like, what role would you want to play? Oh, that's tough. I think I want to be Captain Picard for course. a year. <laughs> His job, I think, is fun because he is able to make like a dent in the universe, as, as Steve Jobs would say, a, yeah. like a small dent, like a change, a positive change. But then it also brings with it its own stressors, right? Yeah. Because it is such a highly visible yeah. job. Yeah. Sometimes I wish I was like Spock. I was you can Spock. I was I right? really as soon as you finished, I was like, what about Spock? Like he's pretty cool. nerd and can yeah. compartmentalize. To be analytical, like yeah. But I think later on we kind of saw that Spock repressed a lot mm. of his own feelings and then that didn't go quite well for him. Yeah. So I don't wanna be the I don't wanna be one that represses or suppresses my to, oh my gosh yeah to be able to be like to be like perfect like i said earlier i don't aim for perfection i aim for excellence and i want to have joy i think that in at the end of the day that's what i was going for like to have joy in my career and in my life and to be in a place where i'm not just doing things to do them but because i love doing it that is so deep. I didn't even know we were going to go do that deep with that question. But honestly, what you just said is so <laughs> true. Because you want to be able to experience things. And Spock doesn't really get to move into his emotions. He's got to stay very constrained and confined. Even though he's very analytical and he has this ability to think and all those different things. Right. Super deep processing on Star, on Star Trek. And, you know, tying it into nursing, it's totally like what I'm about. For those of you that are listening... Thank you for tuning in today. Fatima, thank you for your time. I enjoyed myself a lot speaking with I, you. I hope we can speak again soon, recorded or not recorded. And yeah. thank you for giving me this opportunity to share some of my thoughts and experiences with your listeners. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. And guys, I'm going to link all her information in the show notes so that you guys can find her, check out her coaching program, and just, yeah, message her if you're wanting something. She's so much fun on Instagram. That's how I found you. So I love your energy on there. Keep it up, girl. And yeah, thank I, you. I feel like we're kindred spirits. So I really enjoyed yeah. that. I'm just getting <laughs> to talk to you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much, Fatima. Have a wonderful day.